So what I will share with you, what I have learned mostly from talking to residents at different levels, uh, and of course my own training, you know, passing these exams, what I have learned. So, uh, I mean, we can do the training, real rigorous training only once in our life. As such, by the time we get fully trained, we are almost reaching 30 or we have crossed, uh, you know, uh, lived more than three decades. So I think the learning has to be good, structured, and you have to get maximum out of it. So this is another slide which I had showed earlier as part of the, our structured training. So what, as specialists, we are expected to do in our, you know, in our post-training professional life. And I think that is what will decide what, uh, these are the learning objectives of residency training. So you will have to provide consultation and communicate with cancer patients, their families, at, not only at initial presentation, during treatment, follow-up, recurrence, and during terminal illness. So you have to understand these aspects. You will have to establish or direct how to establish the diagnosis, the staging of the patient, the prognosis, and fitness for possible treatment. Then set management goals by the curative, radical, palliative, or best supportive care. Decide the treatment modalities, sequencing and intensity as part of a multidisciplinary team. Then provide or direct uh, patient management using radiotherapy, systemic therapy, whatever else is required. And you have to have sound foundation and updated knowledge, not just uh, of your own speciality, but also all branches of oncology, You know whether in this patient surgery would have been the best way or uh, chemo radiotherapy. And obviously you need skills of your practice. So when we talk about, you know, people fear that you may not pass the exam. Sometimes it is just a general nervousness. All of us go through that, but sometimes it is genuine. No one is failed in an exam, exit exam, uh, just because they did not know the staging of certain cancer or did not know what is a percent or if this person histology that, you know, that, I mean, it is understood that this is not possible for anyone to remember each and everything about each and every cancer. That is not. It is when you make a major uh, goof up in either telling the prognosis or the fitness for a possible kind of treatment or you give completely wrong treatment or you have no idea why the treatment is being given or why it is modulated. So that is when uh, and that you don't do just once, twice. You repeatedly do that for many either of the questions and generally it is not in the theory exams it is in the uh, uh, it is in the uh, practicals in the viva oc that is where you have then long case and short case and once you get start getting exposed then people go back and look at your you know what questions you have written how you have answered that and then the more you look at it anyone who doesn't have a sound foundation the more you look into the answer sheets or what they have said more sort of deficiencies you will find so these are the aspects and of course, failure in exam doesn't mean that you have failed in life. It is just that at that point of time, uh, the set of examiners thought you were not fit to uh, practice. You need more time to learn. You need uh, more time to uh, become clear about certain concepts. That is all it means. Okay. And fortunately, there is not so much of stigma nowadays. If someone uh, fails an exam, there was a time where there was a lot of stigma. I think in our Indian psyche, right from childhood, we are everyone is expected to be on top, you know, forget about failing, we're expected to top. So, and that doesn't happen in real life. So, what I will do is uh, uh, come, and not only that, we have to have uh, teaching, we also have uh, teaching responsibilities, and they're also so when we are talking about uh, what you need to learn, you know, there are certain things which we said Thing that will never change, which is a natural history, symptoms, signs, and principles of treatment. And I think that is where, you know, if you goof up in this, so very clear cut or a pathognomonic sign uh, of a certain cancer or a certain stage of cancer, if you miss it or have you no idea about it, that is taken seriously. If you are seriously confused about the principles of treatment of a particular stage of a particular cancer, that is what is something which is taken seriously. And that this is something which will not change the principles of treatment. So this is something you have to understand it well, internalize it. You have read a lot in a big textbook that finally you have to, it has to make sense inside your head and that is what you will remember. Then things that will change to some extent, which is a common presentation. So you should know currently, you know, if you are re you're reading a, a textbook, which is a Western textbook, you have to know 
in your setting, like if you're working in say Northeast of India or North of India or South of India or in a rural background, wherever your uh, uh, kind of patients are, what is a common presentation of the disease uh, in your, uh, this thing? It may be head and neck cancer, but within head and neck cancer, which subside stage grouping, the prognostic factors, all these would change. You know, what was a strong prognostic factor with a certain type of treatment? Once the treatment type changes, the prognostic factor becomes different. Then difference between uh, what is a, a predictive and a prognostic factor, theranostics, and then the outlook and expectations also. And what you need to know quite well, but will change a lot, is how to do the investigative workup, uh, treatment methods, and the combination and sequence. So this also you are expected to know. And you may not know the nitty-gritty of that particular sequence of MRI or something else, but at least MRI is required and which, you know, it should be with contrast or how to differentiate between certain important things or differential diagnosis. These are the aspects uh, you have to know about it. And as trainees, unfortunately, you don't have a choice. You have to learn everything. Okay, you have to know everything. Uh, you don't have a choice. So what we do now, virtual rounds, basically in rounds plus seminars, we try to case-based discussions. Uh, we try to understand uh, the basis of evaluating a patient, setting management goals, choosing the investigation or treatment modality and patient care in both common as well as less common malignancies and uh, you know discussion to bring out principles of treatment, combined modality treatment, physics uh, behind the treatment uh, method you have chosen, radiobiology and genetics, as in this will be done in future courses. Now, what I will talk about is because we have residents not just from our own hospital, many types of, uh, you know, different hospitals. So first and foremost, the, your training depends on the type of hospital you are working in, the type of your department. So there are certain hospitals where they have both undergraduate and postgraduate multi-speciality hospital. And there is a cancer wing uh, with the radiation oncology department. So I'll like give an example of AIMS or some other hospitals, you know, uh, these are, uh, then you have a multi-speciality hospital with a cancer wing or radiotherapy department. And then you have a standalone cancer hospital and which may or may not be a comprehensive cancer center. I mean, like Tata Hospital is a standalone cancer hospital and it's a comprehensive cancer center. And there are some of the regional cancer centers in our country. They are comprehensive standalone uh, cancer hospitals. Some of them are part of a medical college or a larger part, but many of these. And these hospitals may or may not have a full time or a visiting consultant in other disciplines, let us say hematology or cardiology or nephrology. So your training will depend a lot. I'll just talk about uh, these aspects. Uh, so, like, suppose if you are in a UG or a PG multi-speciality hospital, then many times the outside reference will come directly to your department. So, the patient's coming from a different hospital. But there, if it is a large hospital, then many of the reference will come from within your own hospital. So, when you're coming from your own hospital, if suppose there's a renal tumor or a nephrology or a surgical GU unit before referring the patient to you, they would have done full workup of the case. So you will get completely worked up case. Whereas if you do not have a UG and PG multi-speciality hospital, the case will come to you with a minimum workup and that is a difference. So uh, if you are a training in a depart, uh, uh, department where it is part of a larger UG and PG multi-speciality, those residents would have done everything. But you have to see that you have to know because in that institution, everything comes to you fully worked up. That does not happen in your real practice. Patients will come like that, fully worked up. Then you have a multi... So there are advantages and disadvantages. The advantages is that you have a resident, someone who is doing PG, maybe doing DM or MCH or MD or MS in ortho. So if you have doubts, you can go to them and they will... You, many other things you will learn from them. Whereas if you're in a standalone hospital like Tata Hospital, I mean, we are lucky we are part of a medical complex. Uh, there's a KEM hospital, uh, GS Medical College just across the road, but seldom you're so busy in your own hospital that you don't go and meet them. So if you happen to be in a multi-speciality hospital with UG and PG, it will be a great waste of opportunity if you don't talk to residents in other disciplines. We, it is so natural. I mean, it 
you hang around with the people in your own department of course you can hang around with people in your own department but you also whenever required you talk to them then the stand alone uh, cancer hospitals so many times you get very focused learning in that but you are missing the feedback from the other disciplines then i will talk about the types of radiation oncology departments and you know what so in our country there are still many i would say more than 50% of the departments in our country i will say few hundred which are just one or two consultant they have one lenac or sometimes two lenac one or two consultant sometimes the same consultant goes to two or three uh, different hospitals and everyone sees and treats every cancer cell so what is see everything would have good and bad so in this the, i'm highlighting the good aspects of this if you are training in such a department most of the times now because the requirement so md you may not you may have a dnb seat so most of them they will see the minimum number of you know consultants are there but they have much greater contact time not only with the consultant but also the physicist and if you happen you are lucky to get good mentors in a small department you know just you are you are just one or two residents you may be doing your md you may just finish your md you just just gone as a you know as a sr your first job immediately after md and if that consultant uh, is keen to teach and explain to you and is nice with the patient and everyone else and the physicist this will change your life forever then that will be the real learning I mean, no one could have that much of focused and learning but that is a potluck i mean it may so happen that that consultant is so busy helping different hospitals and doesn't have time to teach or not really interested i mean everyone does not want to teach or sometimes they feel uh, you know they are not capable of teaching i think it's just an effort once you start teaching everyone is capable of teaching it is our innate mm -hmm. you feel that you know i am not good in teaching i will expose myself if i start teaching and they they might ask questions so some people will keep my so if you happen to be in that department you ask questions okay and of course uh, if someone is not comfortable answering that question don't sort of probe too much that person will read and come back and explain to you then you are in a medium size department of say let us say 3 to 7 consultants so here every consultant either treats everything or there's a broad division of cancer sites or research interest so say okay these two consultant will see treat say supra diaphragmatic tumors or these two consultants will treat breast cancer and gynae cancers or uh, pediatrics and cns so there are broad classification groupings of there and this in this also you get a good or ideal contact time with each consultant and physicist and actually when you have more consultant then you are exposed to different school of thoughts and this in many aspects could be ideal so if they just suppose suppose a department has two uh, residents or three residents every year there are six consultants and uh, uh, and it's a good uh, center with all the specialties you get a time over a period of 3 years with each consultant you get to spend about 6 months with each consultant and each consultant would have a different training background someone would be from pgi chandigarh someone would be from tata memorial hospital someone would be from uh, cmc velour they have their own you know way of thinking own approach towards the case and if you spend 3 or 4 years in that department and if you are good and people like to talk to you and teach you and you deal with them properly this is a, could be the best sort of learning opportunity uh so this could be excellent in many aspects not all such departments so this will be then a large departments i i mean i have put arbitrary cut off of cell eight or more consultant so here again if you have just eight or nine consultant you may have a broad division or a combination combination of uh, cancer sites so combos could be different as i said it could be just gynae and breast or it could be brain and uh, hematolymphoid or there could be very narrow division like tata hospital is a extreme we have every consultant or every unit is a single site except one or two units so this could be to this extreme so where what are the advantages of this basically you are learning with the leaders and experts so not everyone would have an opportunity that you spend 3 4 years where almost every consultant or every second consultant you uh, deal with or you see them treating patient they are actually uh, leaders in their field they have tons of experience not just in managing those patient but they know what is the latest cutting edge thing in there and that particular cancer because they are much focused and the other thing in this happens in such department as the large department and people who are really experienced most things are very standardized and they follow a protocol or sops okay but despite all this so these are all good points only some trainees will make the best use of this opportunity 
so sometimes because uh, things are so standardized and sops are so you don't realize why this is happening and you just go through that and the moment you join a, a division or a, or a, or a unit for three or four months everything you just follow that so you just basically continue doing what is being done and uh, if someone has not really taken an effort to uh, find out from you what is important what you don't uh, understand or teach you you may not miss it uh, you may miss actually understanding the very relevant point your practice and what will happen that unit after 4 years 5 years 7 years their practice would have changed but because you have not understood the basis why that unit which in let us say in 2010 was still it was the best unit of that particular cancer was doing uh, treatment in a particular way in 2020 you are still doing that but that unit has changed and the reason is because you are not understood the concept why that set of consultants and physicists that unit was doing particularly so while a large department with everything protocolized and with sops and you know really experts treating that patient could done without really understanding the basis and it hampers your future learning and because you have learned all this in a major center you tend to follow that so now i will come to that making diagrams and figures to learn to, for clinical documentation to pass exams and to teach so this is a clinical diagram i, I was maybe one day it was like uh, informal teaching in the in the opd sometime in opd is like in the breast opd is one of our she was a resident then so i draw on a notebook so post mastectomy 2d planning most of us do not know 2d planning just okay, put the border here as the inferior border and people diagram diagram uh, you know so i've shown one side is the intact breast and that was shown because i needed to show where is the inframammary fold and uh, then the mastectomy scar uh, i have uh, shown both uh, the ap view as well as the cross section view in cross section view the heart with the myocardium and uh, the portals are drawn so if you can draw a neat portal if you write try to write everything on that portal there itself on the diagram you will not be able to write write a b c d e and then on the right side if you see i have written what is a where it is at midline or 1 to 2 cm across midline to cover scar in labc or medial quadrant t1 t2 tumors where is your lateral border you just write that if examiner sees that you have drawn this diagram okay is uh, in my that it's a theory exam or a practical exam you have just drawn this diagram and if you have practice you have taken just literally 5 minutes they will not bother to see anything else this is self explanatory and they will be mighty pleased if you have uh, you know uh, drawn this diagram and then they would also want to look at okay what additional things you want to look at so if you suppose you have written the epidemiology that in uh, or except the rural cancer centers everywhere else uh, rural uh, rural uh, areas everywhere else in urban india breast cancer has overtaken cervical cancer as the number one cancer that is very good so this person knows this then you talk about say one or two thing like histology in invasive lobular carcinoma has a predilection for bilateral involvement and transcellomic spread they are mighty pleased so here that is where if they are 25 marks question they might feel like giving you they will no, no one will give you 25 but they will end up giving you say 23 or you know 22 or 23 marks okay so just this diagram they i mean they are so pleased so so practice diagrams and i think after i talk another 5 7 minutes uh, tejashwi who is going to appear in the exam next week i have asked him he tweeted something that he wants to you know be a medical illustrator so he will show you how he uses diagram for his learning and in the exams okay so now just uh, two weeks ago in our uh, on our uh, x ray box i was teaching them how to draw diagrams you know you have to know so a uh, ap view and a transverse view and also a sagittal view so like you know you have to radiation oncologist have to always uh, imagine okay if my b what will be the beam first of all this is what i want to treat this is my target volume where should be the beam arrangement if the beam arrangement if this is if the beam is not modulated where am i likely to get a hot spot where am i likely to get under dosage area and that's what the modulation of the beam or the shielding or the shaping of the beam or uh, a modification of the beam is just basically done to improve the coverage 
uh, with a homogeneous dose, what is your prescription dose? So 95% of the prescription dose. And you see that dose to the normal structures are uh, yeah, within the uh, acceptable dose. So this is like a diagram, standardized diagram. All of you have to do a practice so you can show the staging. So on the left, I've shown that uh, there's a large tumor in the breast and the nipple is little, uh, you know, thickening with, with dotted. And the node I've shown is like a matted node, large matted nodes. I mean, I could have shown and uh, I could have made it a little more craggy. And on the, on the right side, uh, so this is a large tumor, central quadrant tumor. Uh, this central part, which I've made it uh, harsh, this is the skin ulceration and this dotted points are the PDO. And you can, if you've drawn this quickly and if you just label that PDO, I mean, no one would expect you to write the full form of PDO in an exam when you are in a tearing hurry. And you have drawn two small nodes. And if you can just put an arrow, say query significant one by one mobile, that is all that you need. So just one diagram, no one would read the one or two pages description that you have written about this tumor. This diagram is more than sufficient. Okay. Then diagram for documentation. So this is, I just found. So I have drawn this diagram. This I have shown reveals a bending fracture, upper one fourth femur. So because every patient is not walking with the X-ray. So this is an X-ray on the right side. You see, there is a large, uh, it's a mixed uh, lytic and sclerotic uh, lesion, which is going up to the neck of femur. And this patient, if anyone asks to ask them to stand or make them walk, there's a very high chance that in the outpatient clinic itself, this patient would have a fracture. So when, if I know I can make the diagram, I will quickly make the diagram and don't feel bad that your femur looks like something else. As long as it broadly resembles a femur, a femur does not look, uh, you know, a rib or something else, clavicle, it is all right. Okay. Uh, so you don't hesitate. You know, many times we are hesitant in making diagrams because our people will laugh at us. Let them laugh as long as it serves the purpose. Doesn't matter. So this, in this patient, drawing this was, useful in clinical documentation that anyone who opens happens to see that will know that this patient has, uh, they may not read the line, what I've written, but looking at the diagram, they know this patient has a risk for fracture. Then, you know, this is uh, some years ago, I don't know who was the resident who do the diagram. So this they have copied. So in this patient, we were expecting that there it is a radiation induced heart disease. Patient had received treatment earlier. And uh, uh, so they had copied the diagram. The patient had a uh, angiography. So they, you know, so sometimes even copying a diagram. So once you know how to make diagrams, you can copy. And later on, when the patient comes on follow up, they may not have the full big fat file from the cardiology department, or they may have left it home, or you will not know where to find. So if someone wants to correlate, you know, when you uh, ultimately all sciences are correlative sciences. So you could see how to where was the blockage. Okay, like this diagram again I've made. I mean, now I mean, someone could laugh what kind of femurs I've made, what is the pelvis, but it serves the purpose. This patient had had multiple courses of radiotherapy in our hospital and other hospitals uh, and also uh, a pathological fracture. So in this itself, one go, I know that this patient had uh, L2 to L4, eight gray single fraction in red in September, 2015. And uh, then this uh, lumbosacral spade, uh, the green one uh, was, uh, uh, I have written here somewhere else, had received RT earlier. Then this femur and uh, the hip joint, including up to, so I've shown that it is coming up to the uh, uh, obturator foramen, the medial edge 25 in November 2015, then 25 to the opposite, uh, this thing. And then uh, right hemipelvis, August 2012, eighth grade. So if this patient comes back, if I have to rewrite it, if I'm just looking at the notes, it will be very, very difficult. When I draw this, because I'm confused, I do not know what to do. So that is when I will draw this diagram. So, and people have had re-radiation. I've seen a case of radiation cystitis because patient had three or four courses of radiotherapy to the pelvis for bone meds. And because of that, the patient had radiation cystitis. So if you had 20 in 5, 20 in 5, 8 gray, one fraction, and again, 13, 10, I mean, that is more than enough to cause radiation proctitis or cystitis. So these are the values of this thing. So I think uh, now what I will do is ask, uh, I will stop my screen share and uh, uh, Tejeshwi, uh, Tejeshwi, you're there? Yes, sir. So now you can start your screen share and you have full half an hour or whatever time you want to take. He said, I'll finish in 10, 15 minutes. I wanted to give him more time because I think what he says 
that will have a greater impact on him and i am actually impressed with uh, tejashwi let me say that i mean it so happens he is my md student but that doesn't matter Ir- irrespective uh, i am impressed with and he tweeted that and i picked up as a wow this is what we want a student teaching their life last week we talked about student led seminar so when students are teaching they have the maximum impact on fellow students if they are good teachers so tejashwi come on uh, yes the white board is all yours Yes, he'll be drawing live diagrams. I think some some live and some kind of. Can you see my screen, sir? Yes, we can very well. Uh, so today I'll be today I'll be speaking about uh, how. Uh, we can use uh, pictures to uh, gain more information to you know understand and also memorize more information from what we read. In general, we read a lot of text, and not all all of that text gets into our head directly. And also, when we have to recall and review that information later, and that later could be one year down the lane or even one month down the lane, it's not uh, pretty easy when we have when uh, if we have to go back to the text again. So it helps if we can make little diagrams. And by diagrams, I just don't mean uh, uh, pictures of, say, uh, pictures that we have been drawing in our 10th standard or 9th standard, which are anatomically correct and, you know, appropriate and, you know, realistic. But it could also be uh, small stick figures or, you know, infographics that, that make sense to you and that delivers the information that you want them to deliver and, uh, you know, absolutely serve the, and ultimately serve the purpose. So I have included these isodos charts that I have drawn in the first uh, year. Tejeshwi. Uh, yes, speak sir. slowly. Take your time to explain. There's enough time, okay? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, I have uh, uh, I included these isodos charts that I have drawn as uh, first year resident, maybe in first, second, or third month. There are some mistakes in this. I included this on purpose because I can, you know, now I can uh, figure out the mistakes that are there in these isodos charts, but. The purpose of this was that uh, I was just trying to put uh, two and two together and uh, figure out how the dose distribution varies if for a four field box or if I put wedges and if I don't use wedges. Actually, the first picture uh, for a head and neck you can see on the uh, left corner is a tumor in the black. I was trying to put two bilateral portals and see how the dose is, how the dose distribution is, and then just an anterolateral portal without the wedges. And then I put wedges, and this is all just approximation. But if you can, if we can go back to our uh, original Lazarus charts and map it, then we can get an accurate description. But this was just for the understanding. So one thing that I got from this is I could better understand how to, uh, you know, uh, how the dose varies when we are putting an anterolateral portal or using wedges. And if it comes to the four field box technique, how we can differentially weigh the fields to, uh, you know, decrease the hot or to achieve the uh, needed a dose at the where the field is. So this is one uh, exercise. So, I think. just one second, okay? Yes. So you know this at least because you have done this exercise, you will never put the wrong direction of wedges. Sometimes it is so many people have actually failed exam. They had of course now we you don't use wedges so often. There was a time when wedges without wedges you cannot create. They had absolutely no concept of how to use wedges, where will be the thick end, where will be the thin end. Forget about what will be the, what is the hinge angle, what is the wedge angle. You know, it is, uh, so uh, you will, although this was for practice and, you know, this was rough approximation, you will always know what is the orientation of the wedge. That is the most important thing. Carry on. Yes, sir. Uh, and then the other uh, idea is to memorize uh, things like, for example, contouring. The most important things that we contour as residents in radiation oncology is the neck nodes, two, two, three, four, level five neck nodes. So from the Gregor contouring, that is when I started learning head neck contouring, what I've done is I've made a rough sketch of the uh, anatomical uh, uh, structures as on, on an exit section. And then I just delineated where the neck node uh, is situated topographically. Like this is an example of how I have delineated axially on level five and also craniocordially. If you look at the left hand lower corner, it's just a stick figure of a, of a man. And I've drawn the transverse cervical vessels and the hyoid. So uh, what I was just trying to get at is to memorize on an axial section, what are my boundaries of level five? And also what are the craniocordial boundaries? Because until we do a lot of 
like uh, uh, contouring on the system, which might take a while. We cannot just memorize it by reading the guidelines. So this was easier for me. Uh, and also, if at all, I have to draw a, a contour or a rough contour picture in my exams. This would help me in, you know, at least visualizing it. And also, the, uh, this like Sir has uh, just shown us a femur and has shown us how he has torn a fracture. This is something that we do a lot on uh, 2D conventional planning, and this might help us to visualize the portals. This is something that I have taken for uh, anal cancer planning. Uh, this uh, picture is from actually uh, the ACT2 protocol for how we plan the anal cancer. So, uh, uh, this is about what volumes need to be included for the phase one and phase two plan. Uh, it's just not about anal cancer. Once we can draw these landmarks, uh, uh, these bony landmarks, it gets easier for us to visualize them even when we go for 2D conventional planning and also uh, ma uh, be able to uh, mark the borders uh, uh, you know, more confidently and also understand like, where the disease uh, lies with respect to these bony landmarks. And uh, one other thing I use uh, pictures for uh, is to memorize staging because uh, oftentimes staging is something that we uh, get confused and it's not easily uh, memorizable. And this is on the left hand, I have used the lung cancer, uh, I've, I've used the AGCC 8th edition TNM staging to draw the rough pictures of it. Uh, I know AGCC provides uh, its own pictures, but if you look at the lung cancer, the lung cancer pictures especially, they are very extensive, they're anatomically very correct. and uh, they're not colored and also the fact that uh, they actually use every individual substage of T, N and M to represent one picture. It doesn't, uh, you know, is, is, for me at least it was not easily uh, captured by my memory. So what I did was I used for a single T stage, like say one or two or three, I used a single picture uh, so that it captures the essence of what it is. So that if I have to say what is T3, I can just memorize this picture that's lying beside T3 and I know all the components of it. And similarly with the wind staging. So what I also did for the wind staging is I've also included how we treat it. I mean, I've cropped it out from the picture, but I have put uh, like more than one information in these pictures and uh, like uh, staging along with some treatment paradigm that we can use it together. It's not just about pictures because uh, I know a lot of us might not be able to make uh, accurate or like, you know, pictures that... Uh, I mean, because I know a friend who has drawn uterus for her hysterectomy answer and then she just rubbed it off because the uterus was not good enough. So we also uh, would, it, it, when it helps us if we can make just infographics out of uh, whatever we are learning because when we go back and we want to review in a rush, uh, they help us capture uh, maximum information. So I know a lot of, uh, I know recently we had a seminar on uh, radiation protection uh, and uh, if uh, you were there, you might be able to recollect a diagram like this. So what I have done in this diagram is I've just put as much information as I can, including the what a primary barrier is, secondary barrier is, beam stopper, the contamination neutrons, and also the personal monitoring devices where they need to be used. So if I can actually reproduce, even if I can actually think of this picture, I'm at least you know close to get the basic concept of what radiation protection is and why it is important and you know the basics of it at least. So even some pictures like this might help you you know, retain information for longer and not just, it's, it's not just about memorizing and retaining information, but it's also about forming concepts visually, which is, which stands longer than what you do if you just read text or like, you know, read tables of flowcharts. And other thing I use color or, you know, editing PDFs or, uh, you know, drawing diagrams is to enhance the graphs and charts that are already given in our class, in our uh, standard textbooks. This is a diagram from Kogan. If you ask me to explain this, I don't think I will be clearly explaining it again. But this is a picture I found. Uh, it's the comparison between the LQ model and the NSD model, how one overestimates over the other. So what I have done is, I've, uh, this is a black and white picture that we get. But I have actually, when I read it a long time ago, I tried coloring these graphs. Almost all of uh, the radio radiobiology and radiation physics graphs, where they are not in a colored format, which is what uh, most of the... like. Uh, uh, Textbooks like Kogel or textbooks like uh, Meredith and Massey or Khan uh, generally have, or the colors might not be too bright, it might not convey a lot of information. You can accentuate these colors or, or write beside it in words that you understand so that when you're going back, 
uh, and uh, when you're looking at these things at the last moment or when you try to when you don't want to read the entire text to make sense of these graphs which are pretty important uh, you'd be able to do it you know pretty easily and the other thing is uh, summarizing treatment paradigms within a single sentence this is not exactly a picture but this is something i often do while i am studying either in the form of a flow chart or a table so for example here is something i did when i was studying about dcis like the treatment paradigm was mastectomy or bcs plus rt i've put everything that i could in like a single uh, page on my uh, note taking app i mean it it extends but i just cropped it out so i uh, have written evidence about mastectomy evidence about bcs and rt and how these two have not been had, uh, compared head on and such and such and how rt decreases local recurrence so if if at all a patient walks in and then you need to have a quick review of what happens and like you know what uh, what is the treatment paradigm especially in situations where you don't often see these kind of you know a uh, uh, quick summaries really help you along with this that you can make there is uh, also like a lot of uh, uh, there are there's a lot of such kind of uh, creative content on the internet as well for example there are a lot of trial some uh, uh, trial summaries and also other radiation oncology uh, information that is depicted in such format uh, by uh, instagram account that you can follow by instant oncology i think everybody knows the dr levan so you can either follow her and add add her uh, uh, posts to your resources so that at the end moment or whenever you feel like studying that particular concept you can just go back and that makes your entire learning process easier because she has you know broken down things very easily to understand and pick up the important concepts from whatever it is and uh, uh i mean uh, that summarizes it very uh, easily without you having to go through the entire paper although i recommend going through the entire paper if you have to completely understand it and this is one final uh, uh, thing that i uh, prefer studying like so whenever i'm reading a, a disease or whenever i'm reading a, a disease a site i generally uh, read I read it as a hub and spoke uh, model as in i uh, like you can see there's nsclc written in the bottom corner and then i uh, i start tracing it from one end and then there are multiple arrows that lead from that particular that one point to uh, to the other points that lead to it like it's it's kind of chronology that i follow like how we evolved for treatment i can just uh, so this is a, this is this is how i do it i start with one particular topic that i want to study and then i go for how it evolved Start with RT alone and induction chemotherapy, and how it entirely evolved. Like how concurrent chemotherapy became standard of care, and from there, like how we have gone to dose escalation and how that didn't work. And this one corner about how NACTRT has been tried and what are the current situation of NACTRT. So this is something that helps me actually understand uh, where we are uh, with the treatment currently. Like uh, it, it also also helps me understand how the treatment evolved. Although this might be that bit extensive you might not be able to do this in all disease sites because you might not find time for all that but if you are if you are really interested in a disease site and if you have read some uh, so extensively that you can do this i think you will be getting a pretty good grip of like you know how treatment evolved and to make a better decisions so in short uh, i i would actually uh, for i mean to uh, the the uh, to, to summarize i would like to like uh, recommend digitizing your notes over uh, you know making notes on your book although i know making notes on a textbook and with a pen on a book and a pen you know makes you feel better digitizing notes because they're going to stay with you longer and also you can you have a, like a soft copy format of it you can carry with you the apps i use for that is a notes i know i'm sure a lot of you might be having an ipad right now for studying concepts is one app that i use which gives me that limitless paper uh, and also i can zoom in and zoom out and i can add content whenever i read about it like you have just seen because the content just keeps flowing in maybe your consultant says something 5 days after you read something or maybe a new case and then you uh, you know you learn something new about it so if it's a notebook if it's a running notebook or a few pages you run out of pages but if it's like a limitless paper experience then i think you can add more you can add content as and when you learn content that's one advice that i learned much later in my residency but i would like to give my juniors and to edit and reading pdfs i use document but i know there are a lot of apps out there and you can choose whichever is good for you 
and this is one uh, Instagram account that I uh, that I I want you guys to check out so that uh, you know uh, you can have a stock of things that uh, simplified were in simplified versions for for you to later for refer to. So that's it. Um, thank you. Thank you. So like radiation breakal plexopathy, you understand the concept. So you ask. Similarly, another resident who has uh, just finishing his gynae posting. So everything, I was very happy in the first few months of the earning department, that person had done intracavitaries. But when I tried to probe that, you know, what is the most important thing? And then how do you reduce the dose to the rectum and bladder? So, I mean, that person knew that it is with packing. But, you know, when you were asked, that was not coming out clearly. So uh, in every unit, there will be certain things which are very specific that is being done to either improve the cure rates or reduce the complication rates you should be aware of. There are certain peculiarities about every cancer site so that you should be aware of. And that is in terms of treatment or clinical evaluation, even in terms of his, uh, clinical presentation or epidemiology. If you know what are the specific aspects which are unique to a particular cancer, it could be like a, a, a strong uh, a bias in favor of either male or female ratio. It could be a particular region of the country which has uh, that cancer, which is much more common. There could be a unique etiological factor. There could be a specific uh, occupational hazard. All those aspects you have to know about uh, uh, that particular cancer. And rest, I think it is systematic learning. You cannot excuse, uh, you know, there's no escape from that. You learn uh, and you, as Tejasri showed that, making notes, digitizing your notes, okay? They are so useful uh, and making the diagrams and uh, that will be useful, not just only for your learning, but when you want to write in your exams, both in the theory as well as in practical. So I think uh, if all the residents uh, go through this, when then before the exam, I mean, there's a concept now people get preparation leave. When we were exam going, we did not get even a single day preparation leave. But if in your two and a half, three years, you have not really had a structured training and you haven't had a proper way of learning, even if you are given six months before the exam just to sit at the room or in the library to study, you will not get it. Best learning happens when you are going through the clinical rotation. And I think that is what you all should uh, not miss out on and uh, get the best out of it.